Ryan, what's on your radar? So over at The Intercept, I have a new essay up that combines a number of the themes we've been talking about here on the show, including the survey conducted by Jacobin we talked about yesterday with Matt Karp. One point I try to make in the piece is that whatever you want to call the new approach to racial justice education in schools, critical race theory, DEI, whatever, there are two important questions. The first and the most important is whether or not it makes for a good curriculum and a good education. The second question is whether the curriculum is popular with parents and with voters. To me, if the answer to the first question is yes, it's good for kids, then it's worth fighting for even if it's not immediately popular. That's what social justice movements are supposed to do, fight to make good but unpopular things popular. But that's not what this is. This new attempt at a curriculum where they tell kids that their race, whatever that may be, defines who they are is not actually good for them or good for society. In fact, research has shown that it leads directly to reduced creativity, which is the opposite goal of education. Studies have also shown that it actually ends up promoting racism and justifying social hierarchies. Now, look, race is obviously a part of everyone's identity, but teaching children that they are and will be forever divided from classmates of a different race doesn't even pretend to have a purpose. Think about it. Let's pretend you could convince every kid that that was true. How have you made the world a better place? How have you done anything at all to unravel white supremacy? All of the research and common sense suggests you've only strengthened it. Meanwhile, parents across the board say they have no objection to teaching the ugly truth about America. Yet there's a way to do that while also inspiring children to believe in the possibility of a better world. And that's by giving them a genuinely diverse range of heroes to help tell the American story, a story of an ongoing fight against tyranny and oppression. In his famous speech in 1852 called What to the Slave is Your Fourth of July, the great Frederick Douglass put it well. He said, I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. You declare before the world and are understood by the world to declare that you hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet you hold securely in a bondage which, according to your own Thomas Jefferson, is worse than ages of that which your fathers rose in rebellion to oppose, a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. So in his speech, Douglas condemns the actions of slaveholders like Jefferson and contrasts their behavior with their vision for the nation. And he urges the country to live up to its promises rather than sink into its worst impulses. To help students understand that story, characters help, heroes help. Douglas is one obvious hero. Even this guy gets it. Frederick Doug Douglas is an example of somebody who's done an amazing job and is being recognized more and more, I notice. But a contemporary of Douglas's is another example of the kind of person students could be taught about to give them insight into the worst of our history, while coming out of it inspired to endlessly improve and remake the nation collectively with their fellow citizens. I'm talking about Robert Smalls, arguably the greatest American to ever live. So about five years ago, I started work on a podcast about the history of Reconstruction with this guy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Do you want to go by Killer Mike in this or, or Mike Michael Render? Render. Michael yeah, Render. Professionally yeah, known as Killer Mike, but definitely Michael Render. I thought you might want to do yeah, Michael Render. Yeah, I wouldn't Render want my that. mom to be ashamed of yeah, yeah. a child doing something noble, <laughs> calling himself <laughs> gangster rap name. So the podcast is still a work in progress, but there was a particular insight from Render from one of our sessions that has stuck with me since. For some quick background for those unfamiliar with Smalls, he was born into slavery in South Carolina and was trained to be a boat captain in the Charleston Harbor. Early on the morning of May 13, 1862, he did something of breathtaking audacity and courage. With his wife, child, and several other enslaved families hiding below deck, he eased his ship, the planter, out into the harbor's darkness. He had to pass five Confederate checkpoints, and he wore a large hat to conceal his identity, each time offering up the correct password of light signals. Once he could see the Union line of ships, he raised a white sheet to surrender the ship. He became a massive celebrity in the North, but he didn't stop there. 
He linked up with Frederick Douglass, and the two of them lobbied Lincoln to allow black troops to fight on behalf of the Union. Lincoln acceded, and the influx of manpower helped turn the tide. Smalls even participated, went back to the South, fighting against his former owners. Smalls then went back to South Carolina and participated in a multiracial, multiracial constitutional convention, then won election to Congress, serving well past the end of Reconstruction in defiance of Jim Crow. He even created the public school system in the South. For the podcast, Killer Mike interviewed Small's great-great-grandson named Michael Moore. The other voice you'll hear in this upcoming segment is, is uh, Zach Young. He's my producer for our podcast, Deconstructed, over at The Intercept. He went on to serve in the South Carolina legislature, in the House and the Senate, where, among other things, he created legislation that, in South Carolina, created the first free, compulsory, statewide public school system actually in the country. You basically just described one of the greatest Americans I've ever heard about in my life. <laughs> oh, I should have mentioned, Killer Mike was on this call, too. If this was actually taught in American history, you would have kids that already saw each other as equals because they would have stuff to admire about one another. Imagine if a white kid actually grew up, he had never seen a black kid, but he had grew up seeing these stories. You know, he's going to walk into the world a more fair person, a more just human being, because he sees the equality in all human beings for, you know, for having the potential to do incredibly cool things. Yeah. Um, there's even an element of uh, what I, I sort of think of, of sort of uh, poetry in the sense that after the war, Robert got a reward for delivering the planter to the, the Union, to the United States. He didn't get what the law prescribed. I guess they couldn't see fit to give you know, a black man, a formerly enslaved man, that kind of money. But he took that money and after the war was over, went back and bought the house that his master had owned. He ended up buying and living in the big house. And uh, Hey, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. I got to say this. <laughs> On the behalf of just plain speaking black folks everywhere in the world, you mean to tell me this Negro went back and bought that white man's house? He, he, he bought the big house. <laughs> that's, that's the ultimate kick you in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be damn proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I was sitting here as he asked the question, who should play him, right? So I was like, well, who's just a badass rapper? I was like, damn, that's a role that kind of T.I. was born for. I was like, nah, nah, nah. Tip shouldn't play that. I was like, that's a little too, he's a little too gangster. By the time you got to the part about him buying the master's house, the old big house, I was like, yeah, that sounds exactly like some things my homeboy T.I. would do. Now that's the kind of history you could get kids interested in. And also one that teaches them the worst of what we've done while instilling pride and hope in what can be overcome by fighting back. So let the right wing try to fight that rather than Robin D'Angelo. Now, asked why he thought kids weren't taught about Robert Smalls, Render said this. And the question's always the same. Why haven't I heard of this guy exactly. before? Black people are purposefully kept out of Southern history and purpose purposefully kept out of American history. To deny these historical figures access into our history books and our classrooms and the lives of our black children is to do something very evil because what you rob them of is the confidence it takes to be the next great American that contributes to the culture. You deny them an opportunity to be a Robert Smalls. Um, and that's a very evil thing because I think that if black kids had the confidence that they deserve, knowing that they've been such an instrumental part in building this country, you would have less anger and aggression and you would have more wanting to fix this country for the benefit of First and foremost, me and my community and yeah. the greater community. But like, you know, it's uh, it's what you were saying on the phone with Michael Moore. This is not a person who should be only of interest to black people. Like the story of commandeering the planter is one of the more impressive stories of military heroism in this country's history. Yeah. And I think that a great injustice has been done to white America and not knowing names like Robert Smalls. Um, I think that you all have been denied the full American experience. And I think you should be angry about that. To deny that not only denies the authentic contribution that black people have made as a part of this country, to deny that to the African American is horrible, but to deny that to white kids is evil because you're creating a doubt in them of their fellow American. You're making sure that they never respect their fellow American. So Robbie, that insight has always stuck with me because 
it's, it's such a profound approach to anti-racism to, to come at it sort of from the bottom up that way, to teach elementary and middle school kids about Robert Smalls, about the heroism of Robert Smalls, would then have all of the kids in the class being like, this guy's awesome, amazing. And, so, and they would all feel pride in him, not just the black kids, not just the white kids, all of the kids would. And what Killer Mike is saying there is that what it, what it could do is counteract the messages that a lot of white kids are getting, that they're better than, and that, mm -hmm. that their black classmates are less than. In, and in fact, they're hearing the opposite. No, like this is one of the greatest American heroes. And it, so it, 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 it's, it's anti-racism. Like it's a theory of anti-racism by, by lifting everybody up. And history class is the right place to do this rather than what the trend is among the people you're criticizing, the diversity consultant kind of class, is to create this new other class in schools where they'll go to learn this kind of pseudo-scientific-y idea about that is reinforcing mm -hmm. some kind of racial uh, ideas about what races do what and what races are, are like, that, I, that I, is not scientific and is not educational. Where, but in our history classes, we, could, we should do exactly what you're saying and yet talk about those other heroes, you know, paint the full picture of our history, and it, it can be affirming and, and admirable and praiseworthy to talk about what, what we overcame, what we as a nation overcame. Right. And in, in some ways, when you have Black History Month in February, you know, what you're, what you're telling students of all races is that, well, there's... There's American history, and then there's that black we're going to do, and the, but right. but that's clearly not the case. Like Robert Small's contribution to the war, it, it would it would probably be too much to call it like decisive. Yeah. But if but if you made that argument, you you wouldn't be crazy. Like like it was such a massive morale boost to the North. He was a celebrity beyond all recognition because all of the Northern papers took this story and they're like, oh my God, mm -hmm. this is amazing. Because they also knew that the South was humiliated by right. having It was this demoralizing guy. for the South, right. And then for him to join up with Frederick Douglass and, and use what he had done to persuade Lincoln to allow black troops to enlist added several hundred thousand men at a moment that historians do say is crucial. That a lot of the white people in the North, were, were, there were draft riots, like they, they, were, they were turning against the war, there enough of this. To have that infusion of, of manpower, you know, there are historians who say that that, that in particular uh, turned turn the tide. So this is not just a February mm -hmm. hero, even though he's not even talking about much in February. This is, a, this is an American hero. And if, if, if you channel, I think, your, your history through, through that lens, you tell a story that everybody can be proud of while acknowledging all of the worst, because his story is the worst, born, in, born into slavery. Right. That is the way forward. <laughs> not, uh, not some of these other things. This it can be done. We can teach this. We can do this. Yeah. We can do this. Team Rising joins us next, so stay tuned for that.